Crowley, Benson, Jack, Braun, Captain Flint, Brain Trust, Earl Sanderson, Silver Helix, Chop Chop, Young Troll, Stopwatch, Will and Wisp, Turtle, and Xavier Desmond. Hello, welcome to Card Table. All right, so today it's uh, book 15, uh, Black Trump. So this is the final book in the Card Sharks triad. The the Card Sharks, uh, they're still they're still active and they're still kind of a force to be reckoned with. But by the end of Volume Fourteen, they've sort of been outed. Uh, they're no longer quite um, quite as insidiously sort of uh, and inextricably woven into all all strata of society. They've sort of uh, they've sort of been exposed, and, and the world now knows they exist. But there are still some here and there kind of planted in key positions, uh, and uh, the leader of the card sharks, Pan Rudo, uh, is is still alive, still out there, and he's kind of uh, ac- actualized a doomsday scenario. They've created a black Trump virus, um, which is uh, capable of, um, at least in theory, is capable of... of killing anyone who, who is a wild card. Anyone who has the wild card gene or is infected by the wild card virus will be killed by this virus, whereas it's harmless to any gnat. Um, and so this is their uh, final solution, as it were. And so at this point, um, we get our another example of a full mosaic, uh, just like uh, volumes three, six, seven, and 11, where it's it's still multiple authors, but it's not an anthology of short stories. It's, it's a single novel. Uh, each each author in this case there are five authors each writing one character and we're just cutting uh, back and among those five different characters. This time out uh, we've got George R. R. Martin himself. Um, just like uh, in the previous arc, he was kind of absent for most of the books, but then came back for the Volume Eleven Dealer's Choice. And this time uh, he's he was then absent from twelve, thirteen, and fourteen, but he's back for Volume Fifteen. Uh, which is always kind of exciting when the founder shows up to actually contribute some prose, because uh, as we all know, he is uh, certainly a master of the art of <laughs> of prose. So George R. R. Martin is there uh, to write Jay Aykroyd, a.k.a. Pop and Jay. Uh, Vic Milan, my favorite, is there to write my favorite character, Mark Meadows. Uh, Stephen Lee uh, brings back uh, Greg Hartman, but he's actually uh, kind of, a, kind of a, a good guy in this one, or at least trying to be. Billy Ray, who was... Uh, also also a lead character in Dealer's Choice. And then Sage Walker's uh, Zoe, as I mentioned last time, her ace name is Blowjob, but uh, they don't really... I'm not sure if they even call her that once in this one. It's it's just Zoe, uh, which makes more sense, doesn't it? If you had a choice between those two names, which one would you use? This this one's a real kind of globetrotting, kind of high adventure, sprawling adventure story. Uh, very exciting uh, as these sort of five characters are all in their own way trying to sort of prevent... The card sharks from from actualizing this 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 final solution. One of the things I love about it is uh, it's it, it it spans the globe in a way that is uh, in in many ways I think more exciting than uh, Aces Abroad. Um, of course, uh, as as we all as we all know, uh, Volume Four Aces Abroad was was about this world tour. It was the first time that we saw uh, to to a large extent um, the wild card universe as it exists not just in New York or America but but actually in other countries and um, but that one was structured in that anthology format and also the world tour gave you this thing of like okay next stop Haiti all right next stop uh, Guatemala now you know now we're down into South America all right now into Europe and or or Asia and uh, India and now we're in Sri Lanka and now we're in et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so very kind of uh, modular, as it were, one country than another. This one uh, is, is I think, a little more exciting because it, it, it has the whole globe-spanning quality, but it's but it's got different characters kind of going to different countries kind of simultaneously in these parallel threads. I think there's at least, I feel like there's one point in the book where uh, like every character is in a different country, <laughs> just kind of uh, pursuing one, one branch of the card sharks uh, tree or you know the one branch of the car trucks organization and trying to to cut off that particular branch and halt its progress uh, so I, I feel like there's a there's a, there's at least one spot in the book where you where you if you were to take a cross section it would be like Zoe is in Jerusalem while Jay Aykroyd is in China while Mark Meadows is in Cambodia while Greg Hartman is in Ireland while Carnifex is in England it, it's part of what gives this book a real epic kind of scope and sweep. Another thing I love about it is um, 
just to just to pay off what I was what I was what I've kind of been complaining about for a few videos now the fact that um, Jay Aykroyd when not written by Martin is uh, just doesn't quite have the same wit I've sort of acted as if that's my own observation I should give credit to my friend John who first exposed me to these books back back in the Dizzle when we when we did a reread of these books I remember um, him saying something like when we got to volume fifteen him saying something like oh it's great to see Jay Aykroyd be funny again. Um, and I, I think that just always stayed with me. And I kind of realized, yeah, um, Jay Aykroyd, you know, he's somewhat ubiquitous presence in the books, but f the funny version of Jay Aykroyd is a little bit more rare. <laughs> I think uh, volume three, volume seven, and now volume 15, um, the, the common thread being those are the three books where George R. R. Martin is the one to write the character. So yeah, he's he's back. He's uh, he's great in this book. He's very funny. One of my favorite threads to follow. Uh, and of course, Mark Meadows, as, as I say week after week, um, Vic Milan and Mark Meadows are my faves. So I love seeing them in this book. I love Carnifex. I, I always enjoy that character as well. So it's uh, there's a payoff. I mentioned last week that there's a, a running gag in volume 14 about Crypt Kicker who keeps dying at the end of one story and then he just shows up at the beginning of the next one with no uh, I mean there is an uh, with with no explicit explanation I mean it's it's made clear uh, that that's just a function of his power that no matter how gruesomely he dies he just kind of is back but I like the way it's kind of not always spoken about it's just sort of uh a thing that you just have to have to, to take for granted that, that he's going to die in one story and just be there in the next without anyone kind of explicitly saying, well, you know, even though um, he recently had that encounter with so-and-so and, -so and, um, and didn't seem to survive, he actually, uh, his ace allowed him to. There's none of that. It's just kind of like, <laughs> it just it's just a, a given of the world. Um, and it, it becomes kind of a funny, uh, to, to my eyes, it, 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 there's a subtle undercurrent of humor to that whole uh, element of, of Crypt Kicker's presence in Volume 14. Actually gets a payoff early on in, in Volume 15 where when we find out that uh, the Black Trump has, that this virus, uh, the Black Trump, that Crypt Kicker has been exposed to it. And there's this whole question of, uh, well, would it even work on him if he's already, he's kind of already dead. The wild card has kind of turned him into this sort of virtually brain dead zombie um, type character. Um, so maybe the Black Trump won't even work on him and then uh, it quite spoilers it quite aggressively and, and gruesomely does work on him and it, that kind of uh, establishes the stakes early on that yeah this <laughs> nobody's safe from this one if you're a wild card no matter what your power is uh, the black trump will will uh, as the name implies it will trump your power and, and uh, deal you a, a, a lethal hand as it were and so nice payoff to that thread um, and a demonstration it's it's that George R. R. Martin thing that now has become kind of a cliche I guess but that whole no character is safe not that I guess not that Crypt Kicker was necessarily uh, a hugely important character but uh, after being introduced in volume 11 he kind of quickly became a staple because he, he shows up in 12 and 13 I think uh, and in 14 so you get into a rhythm where you're like, okay, this guy's a new fixture of the of the wild cards universe, and then, and then uh, there's the uh, the the G R R M <laughs> classic maneuver of uh, just killing him early off in in Black Trump. The use of uh, Quasi Man uh, is striking in this one since Quasi Man was such an important character in Volume Thirteen, which which kind of started off the card sharks thing. Uh, they use him very well in this one. Um, He's a, he's a little bit of a convenient plot device because he's a character who can teleport um, not only his body but also parts of his mind teleport into the future and the past so he's able to uh, have sort of uh, inklings of, of what's to come and, uh, and, and a sort of uh, a seeming sort of uh, intuition or uh, an uncanny intuition uh, in terms of like where he needs to teleport to at, at certain points in the book. So there's certainly a bit of uh, plot convenience there in the, in the way Quasi-Man is used. Um, but I think it works. It's, it's, it's just enough uh, where it doesn't, see, it doesn't feel too convenient. Um, it, it just it kind of feels just right. Um, and, it, and it just seems right to have him there at the end of the story since he was there uh, at the start. Uh, in volume 13 and such an important presence there. This book, volume 15, is also the end of the uh, the first kind of phase of wild cards um, because the, the books stopped being published for, for uh, about seven years, which in retrospect is not really that long a time, but at the time, to fans, 
it seemed as if that was going to be it. Although there was no formal announcement of that, as I recall. Another good John anecdote. Um, I hope I'm not uh, getting this story wrong, but I remember being very tickled when he told me this story. Since there was no formal announcement that the books were ending, um, and sometimes a few years did go by between one book and the next, or at least a couple. Uh, so I think a couple years had gone by after volume 15, and uh, John kind of sought out one of the authors online, um, possibly Walter John Williams, and sent them a query, uh, something along the lines of, I'm just wondering if there are any more Wild Cards books in the future, or if, if the series is, is over now. And, and then he ended it by saying something like, I'm a really big fan of the books, and I would, I would, uh, I would buy each one as soon as it came out. And the author uh, emailed back and said, oh, so you were the one. So that kind of speaks to uh, where sales were, uh, or, or at least the, the author's perception of how bad sales were uh, by the time uh, volume 15 came about. Presumably, I, that means that I, I, I have a sense when I read volume 15 that even at that point, they knew that that was probably going to be it. Um, they, you know, there's the there's the uh, established wisdom that they would sell these books as as triads. They would get a contract for three books, and sometimes that would extend to an extra book. But generally speaking, it was still uh, in 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 little packs like that. And so they they sort of sold three books to Bain Publishing, which is thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. Um, and you know, obviously, when you look at uh, Bantam Publishing, their first publisher, it was like they sold the the first three, and those sold well enough that they managed to get a contract for three more, and then again for three more or whatever. Whereas with Bain, clearly that didn't happen. They sold the one pack of books, those three, and they didn't sell no more. And so so my guess is that they knew, even when they were, they were doing volume 15, that it was going to be the last, or, or I shouldn't say they knew it was going to be the last because that would turn out not to be the case, but they, um, they must have had a sense that it pr might be the last or, or very well could be. Partly, um, the way that plays out is in uh, Martin's use of J. Ackroyd. There's this great bit early on where Quasiman shows up and says something to J. Ackroyd, having kind of with these intuitions and intimations of the future that he gets. He says something to Ackroyd along the lines of, I, I see you on a blimp uh, fighting a man with half a face trying to prevent a virus from being released. Um, which of course is an image of uh, Jet Boy versus Dr. Todd in the very first book, or Dr. Tote, or Tot or Tote, um, I don't know. So Jay Ackroyd says as much, He's, he sort of tells Quasiman, I think you have me mixed up with Jet Boy. And Quasiman's kind of like, no, it's you, I see that happening. Once, once the novel gets to the end, they, you know, Martin has contrived a way to, uh, to indeed uh, bring the series full circle by having one of the final action sequences be Jay Ackroyd fighting a man with half a face on a blimp. Uh, trying to prevent the Black Trump from being released, which is pretty, <laughs> pretty nice, and I feel like that 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 little element of uh, full circle quality, along with the fact that uh, Mark Meadows and Greg Hartman are both a part of the series, uh, and in Zoe's sequence uh, of the book, um, the sleeper is a is a pretty important presence, virtually a co lead in in the in the Zoe sequence. He's he's a part of part of the Zoe story for a, a very large portion of it, and. Obviously, Croyd, Greg Hartman, and Mark Meadows all, all go back to volume one as well. So there is kind of a nice sense of sort of full circle when you get to volume 15. I think the way the way Martin, Martin et al. kind of bring that all together uh, creates a nice creates a nice loop um, and a nice sense that uh, the things have kind of come around. Um, there's a good there's a, a website, one of the first Wildcards fan websites I remember that was created before the series was relaunched with a volume 16 back when it when it was like 1 through 15 are the canon and that's that's the series um and someone pointed out that yeah there were loose there are loose ends left at the end of volume 15 but if you look at it a lot of like the major characters do have a sense of closure where their story ended somewhere along the way um, you know, with like a character like Demise, who who dies at the end of Volume Six. Volume Eleven gives some nice closure to the Turtle and to uh, Modular Man, for example. Uh, Golden Boy gets a nice bit of redemption at the end of Volume Six, um, and then s some characters. It's at the end of Volume Fifteen. Greg Hartman gets gets some nice redemption at the end of Volume Fifteen. Mark Meadows' story doesn't end, but but it does kind of hit a sort of moment of. I'm not sure what the right word would be, like a, a nice sense of, of 
the end of one chapter. One chapter in the in the life of Mark Meadows has definitely ended when you get to the end of volume 15, even though you definitely get the sense that Vic Milan had more story to tell. Um, unfortunately, he did get the opportunity when the books relaunched. And The Sleeper as well. I mentioned with volume 13 that um, that, that book uh, establishes Pan Rudo uh, kind of retroactively as the, like, the, the arch nemesis of, of The Sleeper, someone that he faced and, and had a major conflict with back in the 50s, not long after The Sleeper first became The Sleeper. Um, so retroactively, it's, 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 there's, this, there's this loose end in The Sleeper's life in the form of Pan Rudo. And uh, as you might expect in Volume 15, The Sleeper does get to kind of have a final reckoning with Rudo. So yeah, a lot of the characters get to have um, some closure and, and, and a sense that their stories um, are, not, are not left completely just open-ended and um, so yeah, I've always I've always really appreciated that element of Volume Fifteen. It really does feel like uh, the authors did a good job of uh, of giving us a proper finale, like something that really felt like you hate to you hate to read read a long series like this and get to the last book and feel like oh man, <laughs> all that, all that work, all that time I invested in this, and this is how they choose to end it. Um, I think Wild Cards really pays it off. Uh, I th- I think I've mentioned that before that they always stick these landings, these these full mosaics that they use to end the triads and the tetrads, et cetera, are always pretty good. And I think, um, actually always really good. So the, the same ones I mentioned before, volume three, volume six, volume seven, volume 11, and now 15 are all really peak points in the series. Um, and they always bring uh, their, 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 their particular, their respective arcs to a really rousing conclusion. And I think in the case of volume 15, uh, it kind of brings the whole series up to that point to a nice conclusion, as well as being a really satisfying ending to the Card Sharks triad. So that's that's the, that's a general overview of, of Volume 15. I'll, I'll do one more video on Volume 15 just to sort of get some of my last thoughts out there, just to sort of, just to wax rhapsodic a little longer. Um, uh, but that's a general overview of Volume 15. Next time I'll just go uh, go through and look at a couple of details that really stick out at me as, as things that I particularly enjoy. Uh, so I'll see you next week. Some sparks. He said, we'll get your love growing. But before we get going, may I highly recommend card sharks? I like to go out dancing. My baby loves a bunch of authors. Lately we've had some friction. Cause my baby's hooked on shared world fiction.